Hi, I'm Bob Kovacs, and this is a review of the Panasonic Lumix DMC ZS100. And it is a small enough camera that it will fit in a pocket, which is a good thing. I normally, when I'm working a trade show, I put my camera in my pocket and have it handy so I can pull it out and take photos. And this will fit in the pocket of a sport coat. It's a little bulky. It's a little bigger than its predecessor, the ZS50. This is the ZS50 on the right and the ZS100 on the left. You can see the ZS100 is thicker and it's also deeper. If uh, Well, let's hold them together like this. You can see that the ZS100 is deeper because of the way the lens extends. On the back, the controls are pretty similar between the two cameras. Viewfinder is in the same place, the screen is the same, and the controls are roughly equivalent. So those are pretty much similar between the ZS100 and the ZS50 that I put there. Now let's take a look at the LX100. The LX100 is a competitor price-wise for the uh, ZS100's dollars. So the LX100 is, it looks very similar again on the back. It's got the viewfinder in the same place. Controls are similar. This is the LX100 that's on the right, but it is much thicker with a much more protruding lens. It's heavier, bulkier, it has a hot shoe, which is a nice thing. I wish that the ZS100 had a hot shoe, but there's no place for it. More about that soon. Uh, controls are good on the LX100, but the LX100 has got a dedicated three times lens, that's a 3X zoom, with dedicated controls on it. It's got a dedicated aperture control. It's got a dedicated control that's right here for the aspect ratio. And it's got a handy switch to turn off the autofocus. That's the LX100. And it costs about 700 bucks, which is what the uh, ZS100 costs. So you might want to think that this is a better way to go, or it's a way to consider anyway, uh, if you're thinking about the ZS100. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's get back to the ZS100. As I said, it's about $700. I paid about $700, and I got an accessory kit that included, um, oh, it included a, a, a carrying case, and it included a chip, a 16 gigabyte chip, and some other useful stuff. So uh, it's around $700, depends on where you buy it. The specs and features for this guy, it, they're one of the reasons why I decided to get this. For one thing, it has a 10 times zoom lens, you can see here it's 25 to 250 millimeter lens. That's the 35 millimeter equivalent of 25 to 250. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because it changes depending on what you're doing. The, uh, it has a pop-up flash and it's a darn, pretty darn good flash. One big reason why I got this camera is it has a one inch sensor and it does 4K video. Okay, those are two reasons, not one big reason. Those are two big reasons why I got this camera. It does 4K video and it has a one inch sensor. Now Panasonic recently came out with the ZS60, which also does 4K video. However, it has a one over 2.3 inch sensor. In other words, the sensor is about four tenths of an inch uh, diagonal. That's a pretty small sensor. This is a one inch sensor, considerably bigger than the one over two third inch. Now, one inch sensor doesn't mean it actually measures one inch in any dimension. It doesn't, it's actually fairly small, uh, pretty much smaller than one inch in its biggest dimension, a diagonal dimension. But still, it is a heck of a lot bigger than a one over 2.3 inch sensor. And that is a big reason why I wanted to get it and it does 4K video. I didn't want to do 4K video with a smaller sensor. It just wasn't going to work very good. One other interesting thing that I discovered about the ZS100 after I got it was it will do slow motion at 1080p video quality. It'll do 120 frames per second. That's four times slow motion. It's not super slow, but it's pretty nice and it will do some decent slow motion. It has both HDMI and USB connectors under this little flap here. It's got a micro HDMI port, which you can see right there. And the USB port, wonder of wonders, is the micro USB that you use for a cell phone. So it has exactly the same USB port that you have on a cell phone. Yay, very smart Panasonic, because the charger that it comes with 
is a standard cell phone style charger with a standard cell phone style cable and you simply plug it in here. So that means when you go on a trip, you only need to bring one charger, your cell phone charger, and you can plug it in to both your camera and your cell phone to recharge them. So uh, this has a variety of ISO settings. It goes from, uh, I think, 80, an ISO of 80, up to like 12,600. And I find that it's pretty good up to about 1,600 or so. ISO 1,600 does pretty darn good. And I mentioned something about the pop-up flash going to turn it on. The pop-up flash is mechanically actuated. There's a switch right here. See the little flash lightning bolt? When you slide this, it's not a switch, it's actually a mechanical catch. You slide that over and this flash pops up. Notice the flash. Notice its position. With the ZS100, excuse me, with the ZS50, the flash is off to the side of the lens. It's right here. And it's very easy when you're holding the camera to cover the flash with your finger. You have to watch all the time. But look where the ZS100's flash is. It pops up over the lens. It's almost exactly in the same plane with the lens. And it's above it. That is exactly what you want. Because with the ZS50's flash off to the side, you get a nasty looking flash shadow in certain conditions. Whereas with the uh, flash being above it, as it is in the ZS100, it minimizes the flash shadow. So flash pictures look more attractive. This is a really good idea for the flash for the ZS100. I wish that the flash could be used as a video light, but maybe that'll be the next generation of camera. So it only works for flash photography. It doesn't work for video. The main viewfinder on the ZS100 is a three inch viewfinder and it's very nice high resolution looks pretty good there's also an eyepiece viewfinder that's what I call it it's an electronic viewfinder over here now when you look through this there's a very small electronic viewfinder in there but it's pretty nice it works well uh, if you're out in the sunlight shooting it is exactly what you want to do one of the hardest focus tasks is focusing a 4k video and I've done that many times using the eyepiece viewfinder so that certainly works well for that the battery is bigger than I'm used to with the ZS50. It's a nice chunky size battery and you can buy aftermarket batteries for it. This is a Wasabi is the brand uh, battery and it fits right in there. It's a 7.2 volt. This is the same as Panasonic. 7.2 volt and the Panasonic battery is I think a 1025 milliamp hour. So this claims to be a little bit more powerful battery. I would guess you know you could take four to five hundred photos on it before you have to redo and that's with using the flash uh, for many of those as well. So, uh, by the way, this also takes the exact same battery as the LX100. Here's the LX100, and this is the Panasonic version of the same battery that goes into the ZS100. Let's talk about photos from the ZS100. Uh, obviously, it has a larger sensor than the small sensor camera, such as the ZS50. So you would expect that it would do much better in lower light. Why does it do better in lower light? Because it has a larger sensor, the pixels on the larger sensor are bigger and therefore they collect more light. So a larger sensor camera, you can expect that it will be better in lower, in lower light than a small sensor camera. Not only is it better at low light, here let me show you some photos in low light. Here's a low light photo from the ZS100 and here's a low light photo from the ZS50 and you can compare the two. In fact, I have a series of photos that I took in relatively low light showing the photo quality of the ZS100, the ZS50, and the LX100. You would think that the LX100 would be the best of all in terms of low noise. So let's do a full frame. We'll zoom in to the maximum resolution for each of these. Here's maximum resolution with the ZS100, maximum resolution with the ZS50, and maximum resolution with the LX100, showing the low noise characteristics. As you can see, the LX100 has the lowest noise of all. These were all set to automatic when I took the pictures. I let the camera choose how it was gonna you know, set the camera to take the shot. So that's the automatic setting for all three of these, and the LX100 is low noise. The ZS100, however, very fine. The ZS50, not so happy with it. 
It, it also has some edgy effects that uh, I don't like that I don't get with the ZS100. I talked also some about the pop-up flash. The pop-up flash is very usable on this camera. I've taken flash photos from as far as 15 feet away and the subjects were nicely illuminated. So uh, also the pop-up flash uh, does not give the uh, red eye effect that I see with other cameras including the ZS50. Here's a shot I took of a very fair-skinned woman at a large trade show that I went to. They were accepting an award and she would normally take uh, photos with a lot of red eye. She in fact complained to me that she normally gets red eye with when I use the flash. No hint of red eye with the photos of her. So definitely like that. Also, you can do nice macro shots with any of these cameras. Here's a, macro, a couple of macro photos actually from the ZS100. Here's some water droplets on a leaf. And here is a flower in my backyard. And this is in pretty modest light, very overcast day. So I thought these came out pretty nice. There's also a scene mode. So I'm going to turn it on and step to the scene mode. And you can use the touch screen to simply move among the scene modes. One of them is called Sweet Child's Face. So I hope the child's sweet. Distinct scenery. So I guess this makes the scenery more distinctive instead of all just turning into haze. There's a setting for bright blue sky, a romantic sunset, a warm vivid sunset. So there's uh, all different settings. There's a cool night sky settings. Wow. And here's what a couple of the scene modes look like. I'm going to go ahead and take some shots and give you some examples of what scene it was and how the shot looked. Now let's talk about video from the ZS100 and that's where the camera I think really shines. Uh, the ZS100 can record both 1080p and 4K video. It records 1080p at speeds uh, at a, a speed of uh, 28 megabits per second. 4K is 100 megabits per second. So if you're shooting 4K video you are going to use a lot of storage. I went out and got a 128 gigabyte card and uh, you have to get a notice down here it says a U3 so that's the fast speed card that you require for on the ZS100 for 4K video. I have recorded 4K video on cards that were class 10 not U3 they were U1 class 10 and it will record, but also it eventually gave me a message saying that the uh, speed of the card wasn't fast enough for the recorded video and the video recording stopped. So I went out and got a 128 gig card, a U3 card, and that so far has not given me any problems whatsoever and it's a huge amount of storage. Again, if you're shooting 4K video, you are going to use a lot of storage. Now I am actually shooting this video in 4K using a Panasonic GX8 camera which does a very nice job. The GX8 has a micro four thirds sensor which is a bigger sensor than the one inch sensor that's in the uh, ZS100. So it is uh, gives me even better 4K than the ZS100 does. However, the 4K from the ZS100 is pretty darn good and here are some examples of 4K video that I shot with the ZS100. One other thing that I discovered about the ZS100, and I did not see this anywhere before I bought the camera, is that it will do slow motion 1080p video. So that's HD, full HD 1080p video. It'll do at 120 frames per second. So to get to it, you have to set the mode dial here to video mode. That's the video mode. Turn the camera on. Call up the menu and you need to step through the various menu settings and here you go high speed video 
go to high speed video and turn that on and now you will record 1080p video at 120 frames per second and it does a pretty good job I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off here's how you get to the 4k uh, video setting in this camera so uh, you go into the record quality menu the top setting is 4k 100 megabits per second and it's 30 frames per second uh, this is uh, 4k 100 megabits at 24 frames per second and then you've got full HD 28 megabits 60p 60 frames per second full HD 20 megabits at uh, 30 frames per second so that's 1080p video but 30 frames per second versus 60 frames per second and there are other settings here is uh, HD at 10 megabits and you've got VGA which is 640 by 480 and so uh, obviously you can record that for quite a bit of time now you can set this to record either MPEG-4 or AVC HD however you do not get 4K with AVC HD if I go to AVC HD and now go to record quality the top thing that it gives me is 28 megabits at 60p I can't get the 4K so to get 4K you have to use the um, the MP4 format. A couple of other things I want to talk about regarding video. The anti-shake of this camera, really good. Uh, I could be zoomed all the way in on 4K, especially when I'm holding the IP viewfinder up to my eyes so it's more stable, and it, it really works pretty well. It's not like I'm using a steady cam, but pretty darn well. When you're zoomed all the way back, in other words, when you're at the 25 millimeter setting, and I need to talk about that, so don't let me forget, it is very stable. You can walk around and, and pretty much approximate a steady cam effect. Okay, let me talk about this. When you're shooting 4K video, very important to remember this. See that it says 25 to 250, that's the focal length of the lens. That's only for photography. When you're in video, when you're in 4K video, this changes to 37 to 370. So that means you get a 370 millimeter equivalent focal length for telephoto shots. That's pretty good. However, at the wide end, instead of the nice wide 25 millimeter equivalent, you get 37 millimeter equivalent. So if you're shooting 4K video inside in a cramped space, like in a car, for instance, uh, you're going to have some trouble getting the wide shot that you want because the widest shot you can get is a 37 millimeter equivalent. When you're shooting 1080p video, when you're shooting HD video, it changes to 31 to 310. So uh, you get it wider at uh, HD video than you get it with 4K. We have a manual focus control here. So let's talk about that a little bit. I didn't really discuss it when I was uh, talking about the camera's features all that much. So I'm going to go to the uh, focus control, which is right here. And now I can set the focus for macro, macro zoom, and manual focus. If I go into manual focus, now I can focus on some object that's right in front of me using the manual focus ring around here and you can see that now is in focus. So that works pretty well and um, I find that the control is handy to have. I love having the manual focus control right here. I wish it was a little more linear in operation. It's a little, if you're, if you're turning it slowly, it's hard to make it actually adjust the focus. If you turn it quickly, it's very quick to overshoot. I wish it was a more linear kind of feel to it, but Otherwise, it, it's got a reasonably classy feel, and uh, I think it does pretty well. The electronic viewfinder has got a optical control here, so you can set it to work properly with your eyes. Uh, diopter control, that that's called. And um, let's turn the camera on. Let's go to automatic focus. Put that there. Now, you can have a focus box on the screen. This is a touch screen, and you can move the focus box wherever you want it. And you can also do a touch focus where you can focus on one thing. I hope you can see this reasonably well. I can focus on this, and now I can focus on this. And it takes a little while to catch up, but it will eventually catch up. So you can do a rack focus effect while you're doing video, which is especially good if you're on a tripod, just by touching the screen. And it's not perfect, 
but it's not bad. It does a, you know, a reasonably good job of it. Uh, I find that when it gets to its final focus, it kind of snaps in place, which makes it eh, maybe not so attractive. But it's better than not having that capability at all. So the touchscreen is nice to have, and you can use it to, if you want to be sure you set the focus on something that's up in the corner and it stays there while other things are happening in the background to the left of it, you can do that with this camera and it works pretty well in that regard. So what do I like and not like about the Panasonic DMC ZS100? Well, first of all, it takes much cleaner, sharper photos than the ZS50. Uh, that's really nice. I really like it right out of the bat. I noticed that the photos were substantially better. Uh, the photos from the ZS50 are fair at best. Photos from the ZS100, I would consider them to be very good, much better. The built-in flash on the ZS100, much better than the built-in flash on any other pocketable camera I've ever used. Obviously, an external flash will do better, but, but this is a very good uh, pop-up built-in flash. 4K video, I love 4K video. I've posted several 4K videos already on YouTube. This is in fact a 4K video and uh, more and more of my videos, my 4K videos on YouTube will be from the, the, the ZS100 camera because it does do a good job with that. The lens and the sensor, the 10 times zoom lens and the one inch sensor having that bigger sensor than you get in the typical pocketable uh, point and shoot camera, having that bigger sensor makes for better depth of field you get a nice, soft, out-of-focus feel in shots where you've got the foreground in focus, the background out of focus, and that does uh, works very well on the ZS100. Uh, the digital zoom, this is actually the first pocketable camera that I've been able to use, the digital zoom, and it's actually okay in some applications. It has a reasonably convenient manual focus control, which I like a lot. However, because the focus control is flush with the bottom of the camera, when you attach the camera to a tripod, you can get in trouble where the, the plate on the tripod can actually interfere with the focus ring. So you have to be careful about that. It's still a pocketable size. It's bigger than the ZS50, but not so much that it won't fit in a pocket. There you get a better look at the size of the ZS100 versus the ZS50. The eyepiece viewfinder is good. I love to have it uh, when I'm out shooting in the sun. Uh, it's also very good to hold it against your eye to better support the camera. So the touchscreen display, I, uh, the ZS50 does not have a touchscreen. I very quickly got used to the touchscreen on the ZS100. It works very logically. I'm actually surprised that it works so well. You can go through the menu and select things with your finger. You can select them with the controls up on the side. Very well done, it's very logical. And I really, really like that it uses a standard US, a standard cell phone USB port for the uh, connection, the USB connection. So you charge the camera using one cable that you use for your cell phone. You can also use it in the camera. Very smart on Panasonic's part. I give Panasonic a lot of praise for doing that. Okay, now what don't I like about the ZS100? Well, Topping the list is the price. The price is absolutely painful. I paid $400 for the ZS100, excuse me, I paid $400 for the ZS50, which now can be bought for $250 or so. It's, it's a, a much lower price camera. Uh, the ZS100 was $700. Now I got some accessories with that, but okay, let's say the accessories are worth 50 bucks. I paid 650 then for the ZS100 camera. A lot more money. Uh, I found it kind of painful, especially when, when I wasn't sure of what the ultimate quality was going to be for the photos and videos. Uh, it turns out the quality is good, but it's still a lot more money for a camera that's this small. Uh, is it worth it? I'll come to that soon, actually, I guess. Uh, here's some other things that I don't like about the camera. Now, it has an HDMI port, but the ZS100, when you're recording video, the HDMI port cuts off. You, there's no output from the HDMI port when you are recording. If you stop recording, you get output. So that means if you want to use this with an external monitor, you can't use it. If you want to use this with a higher quality recorder, plugging it into the HDMI port, you can't do it. And by the way, the GX8, which is a much more expensive camera still than the ZS100, the Panasonic GX8 is the same way. 
the HDMI port cuts off when you're recording and you can't use it with an external monitor or with a higher quality recorder. Bad Panasonic. Bad, bad, bad. Uh, that is, uh, I'm assuming that's a firmware sort of thing, not a hardware sort of thing. And uh, boy, I sure hope you come out with this, a uh, revised firmware that allows video to come out of these ports because I shoot in the field and I want to have an external monitor. I own an external monitor that I can't use with two of my cameras because the port shuts off when it's recording video. Now this is a small camera. I was not expecting an external audio input, have a, a microphone jack on it. It would be nice to have a microphone jack, uh, but I realized it's a small camera, so uh, I wasn't expecting it to have an audio jack. But it would be nice if it had one. And uh, it's only a 10x zoom. It's a nice 10x zoom, by the way. Um, it goes from f2.8 to f5.9, which it'd be nice to have those numbers a little lower. But uh, it would also be nice to have the zoom, say, a 12 or 15 times zoom instead of a 10 times zoom. Maybe the next camera after this. Let's talk about that F setting. This goes from F 2.8 to F 5.9. Those numbers are a little on the high side. I can live with the F 2.8, but it sure would be nice to go to F 4, let's say, when you're at maximum telephoto. Now, the LX 100, let's turn it on. The LX100 goes from 1.7 to 2.8. That's really amazing. 1.7 to 2.8. Now it has a bigger lens, but it's not that much bigger. Uh, so I'm just wondering what can be done to, uh, to bring the aperture lower on the ZS100, because that would be nice to have. Now, obviously, there, that's not going to happen for this version of the camera, uh, maybe the next version. Maybe there'll be a ZS100A or a ZS120 or something like that. Uh, in any event, it'd be nice to have a wider aperture lens than the f2.8 to f2.5.9. F Once again, f2.8 to f5.9 that comes with the LX, the ZS100. I'm getting my cameras confused. The ZS100 does not have a hot shoe. Uh, now, of course, it has this pop-up flash here, right where you would put a hot shoe. So I can maybe understand why there's not a hot shoe. And the, the pop-up flash is really good. So I can understand why there's no hot shoe. But still, a hot shoe might be nice to power some external accessories. Like maybe you want to plug in a uh, Panasonic wire uh, shotgun microphone that would go into the hot shoe and it would feed the signal in through the hot shoe. That would be nice. Okay, final thoughts. Is the ZS100 worth the money? Well, it's a lot of money. Is it worth it? I'm glad I got it. It does really good 4K video. The photos are, are much better in this camera than the ZS50. So this has become my go-to camera when I go to a trade show and I want to carry a camera in the pocket of my sport coat. I couldn't carry the LX100, it's too big. The GX8 that I also have is much too big. I would have to carry that on a strap around my neck. And I don't want to do that. It's too big. It's too heavy. It's in the way. It gets between me and the people I need to talk to. The ZS100 fits in a pocket. It stays out of my way. It takes admirable photos, easily good enough to publish the photos that I take at a trade show. It takes very good 4K video. The GX8's 4K video is a little better. Still, the ZS100 takes good 4K video. Is it worth it? Yes. Uh, my overall picture quality is very good for photos from the ZS100 and very good for the video from the ZS100, so I recommend it. Hey, everybody. This has been a review of the Panasonic Lumix DMC ZS100. I'm Bob Kovacs. Thanks for watching.